Hello YouTubers and welcome back to another Generation Behind Hi-Fi video. Today I'll be reviewing my JBL 550P subwoofer and will give you my thoughts on how this subwoofer sounds, its build quality, and then I'll perform an SPL test to see how it stacks up to the competition. If you have seen my look inside video or my upgrade video series on this subwoofer, then you probably already know how impressed I am with it. I have been involved in this hobby since the early 2000s and I can honestly say I have never seen a subwoofer this good for so little money. This thing offers insane value for money, and here's why. So what you're looking at here are two drivers. I pulled the gold driver out of my $185 Klipsch R10SW, and the other driver I pulled out of my $189 JBL 550P subwoofer. You don't even have to know anything about subwoofer drivers to know that the JBL is leaps and bounds above the driver from Klipsch. Simply put, the driver from JBL looks like something I would find in a subwoofer costing around $500 or more, and the driver from Klipsch looks like your typical no-frills budget-oriented subwoofer driver. Next, let me explain some of the key differences between these two drivers. First, the JBL driver has a cast aluminum basket, whereas the Klipsch is your typical cheap stamp steel. If you don't understand what this means, let me explain. The cast basket is significantly better because it provides superior strength and vibration control, aka resonance. Other differences include a vented pole piece, large ferrite magnet, insane excursion capabilities for this price point, and a rubber surround. A driver like this JBL from Parts Express is easily $120 or more. So to have something like this come out of a $189 subwoofer is incredible. EXCURSION! Now let's see how much this subwoofer driver weighs. Holy cow, 13 and a half pounds. That's over twice the weight of the Klipsch driver. I have just finished showing you that JBL has included a driver that punches well above its price point for this subwoofer. But what about the cabinet? There's no question that they had to cheap out here, right? Surprisingly, no, they didn't. This cabinet has construction that is typical of a subwoofer costing $500 or more. The front baffle is one inch thick, the center brace is three quarters of an inch thick, and the side and rear cabinet walls are all three quarters of an inch thick as well. JBL even lined the cabinet walls with polyfill. For a subwoofer that only cost $189, that's pretty insane value for money. I was so happy with the cabinet construction of this subwoofer that I decided to do a subwoofer build using this cabinet. If you'd like to see how that project is progressing, make sure you check out my video series called Upgrading a JBL 550P Subwoofer. So if the subwoofer driver and cabinet are this good, then they had to cut costs on the amplifier, right? Probably. This is where I think JBL did the most cost cutting. I did a search on the internet, and what concerned me was the failure rate of plate amplifiers. It appears the life expectancy of these amplifiers is questionable. But at $189, I think it's a risk worth taking. The amplifier provides 300 watts of RMS power and includes stereo and LFE RCA inputs. Other amplifier features include volume control, low pass filter that is adjustable from 50 to 150 Hz, phase control, and a power switch. JBL is pretty generous with the accessories that came with my 550P subwoofer. My subwoofer came with a set of speaker spikes, power cable, instruction manual, and even an RCA cable to connect the subwoofer to my electronics. I have purchased a lot of subwoofers in my day, and not once has any of them included an RCA cable, which is pretty nice to see. The instruction manual comes in a variety of languages and is well written, and includes easy to read steps on how to connect the subwoofer to your electronics. About my only gripe so far is with the speaker grill, which is made entirely of plastic, but at the $189 purchase price, it's hard to complain about a grill on such an affordable subwoofer that definitely makes up for it in other areas.
Now that I got the specifications, features, and other mumbo jumbo out of the way, we can finally talk about what's in everyone's mind. How does this subwoofer sound? I'm going to break this up into two parts. The first part being sound quality during music, and the second part being sound quality and output during movies. Personally, I prefer sealed subwoofer designs over ported subwoofer designs because I think they tend to sound more natural to me. This is a personal preference of mine and there is no right or wrong answer here. It all boils down to what you prefer. That's why it's so important that when you're shopping for a new subwoofer that you order one from a manufacturer or store who has a great return policy. This way you can order several different subwoofers to try out in your listening area and decide for yourself which one sounds best to you. I was really impressed with the JBL 550P's music performance. I had no problem blending this subwoofer with either my Sonus Faber or Bowers & Wilkins speakers. I think the sealed box design really helps this subwoofer blend much easier in a music setting than say a ported box design would. I first connected the subwoofer to my living room system because this room is pretty large and can be challenging for cheaper subwoofers to fill this room with adequate bass. The room is an open floor plan design where the living room, dining room, and kitchen are all open to each other. And I was surprised by how well the JBL 550P did in this environment. This subwoofer had no problem filling my room with adequate bass during my music listening sessions. And that was even at some pretty high volume levels. This subwoofer did a great job of disappearing into my room and never sounded boomy or overbearing. Which is a common trait for most cheap subwoofers, especially at this price point. Another thing that impressed me was how the JBL 550P was able to keep up with my Sonus Fowler and Bowers & Wilkins speakers. This subwoofer had great transient response and for $200 the sound quality was very impressive. No doubt this subwoofer punches well above its weight. My only gripe is that I had to adjust the gain on the subwoofer a few notches higher than I normally do to get the bass authority that I like but I have a feeling this is attributed by the design of the subwoofer. Mainly what I'm referring to is the QTC variable, which I'll talk more about later. As some of you know, I recently purchased a Dayton Audio DATS V3. This tool allows me to find the TS parameters of various speaker drivers. Here are the TS parameters that I measured for my JBL 550P subwoofer driver. I then used those parameters to model the performance of this subwoofer in WinISD and it totally explains why I had to crank up the gain on the amplifier so I could get the bass output that I like. If you look at the chart, you can see that this design is overdamped, and that the response curve is far from flat, and instead tapers off almost immediately. A frequency response curve like this is typical for subwoofer designs that have a very low QTC value, and when ISD is telling me the JBL 550P has a QTC value of 0.523, this means the loudness of the bass across the frequency spectrum will not be as loud as the design that follows the Butterworth filter alignment. If you look at the chart, the red line is the frequency response curve of my JBL 550P subwoofer after I perform some upgrades on it. As you can see, at 20 Hz, the red line is a full 1 dB louder than the blue line, and at 30 Hz, the red line is 2.5 dB louder than the blue line. If you're interested in following me on this upgrade journey for my 550P subwoofer, then look for my video series titled Upgrading a JBL 550P Subwoofer. As you can see from the chart, the frequency response is much flatter with the upgrades and is more in line with the Butterworth filter alignment. Not only will the subwoofer sound better with these upgrades, but the movie performance should dramatically improve. But don't get me wrong, at $200, I'm still impressed with what JBL was able to accomplish at this price point. And as I have shown, with a few tweaks, this subwoofer can be much better. For movie performance, the JBL 550P did okay. Simply put, I like it much better as a music subwoofer than I do as a movie subwoofer, and here's why. While the 550P provided realistic sounding bass from explosions and gunshots, it didn't have quite enough output to fill my large room upstairs with adequate bass. During some of the bass heavy scenes in Tenet and Saving Private Ryan, I could hear the subwoofer bottoming out, which isn't good. I had a feeling this might happen because the driver is only 10 inches, but this can be easily resolved by adding a second subwoofer. 
you have a large room, then I would recommend two 550p subwoofers to ensure you have enough piston area to fill the room with good bass. If you have a smaller room, then a single 550p should be more than adequate. I know it was when I tested it in my bedroom system as well as in my home theater room that is in my basement. Both of these rooms I would consider small to medium in size and the 550p performed really well in those environments. The bass was strong and authoritative and the explosions and gunshots sounded authentic and real. Most people starting out in this hobby don't realize how the size of a room can dramatically change the performance of a subwoofer. If you are reasonable with your expectations on what a $200 subwoofer can deliver, then I think most people will be very happy with their purchase. If you have seen any of my previous review videos, then you already know I like to use the intro scene from the movie Doom to perform my SPL tests on subwoofers with. This intro scene from my Doom DVD is absolutely brutal on subwoofers. Last month I reviewed a Polk Monitor XT12 subwoofer that was able to achieve 101 decibels on this test. This subwoofer does have a 12 inch driver and can be found on sale quite regularly for $300. Because the Polk has a bigger driver, I'm not expecting the JBL to outperform me here, but I guess anything is possible, so let's see what happens. For a subwoofer that costs under $200, 97 decibels on this test is incredible. I thoroughly enjoyed my time with the JBL 550P subwoofer. I was most impressed by this subwoofer's music performance. All of the bass notes sounded lively and realistic. Usually at this price point, you're stuck with the one note subwoofers where you can't tell the difference between an explosion or a bass guitar because they all sound the same hence the term one note, but the JBL is nothing like that. At $200, I don't know how JBL can build these and still make a profit. The cabinet alone is worth the $200 purchase price, and with JBL throwing in a decent driver as well as a 300 watt amplifier, makes for a very easy recommendation. The Klipsch R series of subwoofers used to be my favorite subwoofer to recommend for people who are on a very tight budget. But after owning this subwoofer, I will now be recommending the JBL instead of the Klipsch. If you're an audiophile who's on a tight budget, then the JBL 550P, in my opinion, is the best music subwoofer you can buy for under $300 at the moment. And its movie performance is equally as good as long as your room size isn't too large. And if it is, buy a second subwoofer anyways. These things are cheap as chips. Hopefully this video will give you an idea of what to expect from the JBL 550P subwoofer. If you own one of these subwoofers, let me know what you think about it by leaving a comment down below. So long and happy listening.